Welcome to the Love 40 Tennis 2022 ATP and WTA Awards. I'll start off quickly by mentioning that yes, of course these awards are entirely subjective and based 100% on my own bias. Sorry, that's how the Love 40 Tennis Awards work. But if you disagree on a selection or think you have a better one, tell me what you think in the comments section below. For bonus points, provide me with a good reason for your choices that just might make me reconsider mine. Let's start off with the 2022 Players of the Year. If you don't know who the two people in this picturization are, really, what are you doing watching a tennis video anyway? These two, even after their retirements in 2022, are titans of the sport and will be for generations to come. Though 2022 passed without either of them winning a tournament, their retirements had to be the two biggest news stories in tennis for 2022, and thus, they get to go out on top together as ultimate champions as my 2022 players of the year. There is no other fitting end. I won't be coy any longer. We're of course talking about Roger Federer and Serena Williams. I think it is fitting that the two retired in the same year, given how highly they each spoke of one another and what each meant to the sport of tennis. Serena welcomed Roger into retirement by saying how much she always looked up to and admired him. Roger has called Serena one of the greatest, if not the greatest, tennis player of all time. Notice how he didn't specify women's tennis, but was referring rather to all of tennis. The two got to square off once in a Hopman Cup mixed doubles match back in 2019. The two had such genuine fun in their on-court interview. Both were highly complimentary of each other, and the moment was perfectly captured when the two took a selfie together using a cheesy selfie stick. To list Roger and Serena's accomplishments would just take too long. To provide just a snippet, the two combined for more than 12 years at number one, 43 Grand Slams, and almost 180 singles titles. I must say that both Serena and Roger retired much like they played. Serena fought until the end, running out of gas in the third set against Ayla Tomljanovic in the third round of the U.S. Open, having just beaten the number two seed at the tournament, Annette Kontovit, two nights earlier. She demonstrated that she could truly still beat anyone. Roger, on the other hand, retired quietly, falling to number 97 in the world before announcing his retirement, having not played an ATP match in 2022. Cool calm, and collected on the court, Roger retired quietly and gracefully. Fiery and fierce until the bitter end, Serena battled for nearly two and a half hours to defeat Contivate, and then for another three hours fighting off five match points before succumbing to Tomjanovic. In the hallowed halls of tennis, Serena Williams and Roger Federer will go down as two of the greatest of all time. But what about players who didn't retire? Probably names you'd think of on a more traditional Players of the Year list. Okay, Love 40 Tennis can do that too. Starting with the WTA, it's pretty clear that Iga Swiatek simply has to be the Player of the Year, hands down. She won the French Open and U.S. Opens, as well as four WTA 1000 events. She went 6-0 in Grand Slam and WTA 1000 finals. She went 2-1 in WTA 500 event finals meaning she put up an 8-1 finals record in 2022 with 8 total titles. Oh, and she won 37 straight matches. To put that win streak in perspective, that's the equivalent of winning 5 straight Grand Slams plus another 2 matches. To dive into just how dominant a year Swiatek has, she took over the number 1 ranking from Ash Barty in the first week of April and never looked back. She finished the year with more with 6,030 more points than the number two player in the world, Ons Jabur. That's more points than one would have by winning three Grand Slam tournaments. It's more than twice the number of points Jabur had for the year, and more points than the number two and number three player in the world combined. I'll point out, too, that this huge point discrepancy between Swiatek and the rest of the competition is magnified by the fact that Swiatek played fewer tournaments than any other top nine player. She disproportionately accumulated points per tournament compared with any other peer. 
I'm not even sure if you can use the term peer in this case, given how dominant her results were. If there was one downer to Switek's season, and this seriously sounds ridiculous, it is that she didn't win the year-end WTA Finals event, losing to Arna Sabalenka in the semifinals, after blowing through the round robin, losing only 13 games in three matches. Okay, let's move on to the Love 40 Tennis' ATP Player of the Year, where I think there is at least a little bit more room for a reasonable discussion. There are a few players who I think have a reasonable case for the illustrious title, but alas, Love 40 Tennis must settle on one player, and after much deliberation, the choice was Carlos Alcaraz. He was selected in 2022 because 2022 was the year he answered the question, will he win a Grand Slam? I think this is significant because I would say nothing is guaranteed, Grand Slam titles are not assured, and the history of the ATP is littered with players who may have been teen phenoms, but then never won a Grand Slam. I am looking directly at you, Gael Monfils. So 2022 was the year that Carlos Alcaraz went from the question, will he win a Grand Slam, to when will he win a Grand Slam, and the question probably shifted to this around the French Open and Wimbledon, where he made the quarterfinals and the round of 16 in consecutive Grand Slams. However, he ultimately shifted the question entirely to how many Grand Slams will he finish his career with after winning the U.S. Open at the age of 19. Maybe it's premature with only one slam in his belt, but that is what happens when you win your first Grand Slam at the age of 19 and become the youngest player to finish the year at number one. But seriously, with perhaps a decade or more of tennis ahead of him, how many Grand Slams could he win? That is what the discussion around Carlos Alcaraz truly is now. And it is that meteoric ascension that put Carlos Alcaraz over the top and made him Love 40 Tennis's ATP Player of the Year. By the way, Iga or Carlos, if you want to come pick up your awards, you are welcome to Love 40 Tennis' headquarters anytime. Have your people get in contact with my people. This is just a quick look at Alcaraz's meteoric ascension. He started 2020 at number 490 in the world, then started 2021 at number, four, one, uh, at number 141. He began 2022 at number 32 and finished this year, of course, at number one. In three full seasons, he went from just inside the top 500 to the best player in the world. Because Love 40 Tennis wants to highlight as many awesome players as possible, despite already listing four players for the Player of the Year award, I'm going to mention two runners-up. That's how we roll here at Love 40 Tennis headquarters. First, let's start with Ons Jabur, who in 2022 entered the upper echelon of WTA players. All she did is make two Grand Slam finals at Wimbledon and the U.S. Open, one Madrid, a WTA 1000 event, and the German Open, a WTA 500 level event. Her glowing smile and personality makes the WTA and tennis in general better. Anyone who doesn't root for Ons is crazy. Okay, as I said on the ATP side, I think there could be considerable discussion as to who is the true player of the year, and I think Novak Djokovic would have been in this discussion. His year began in controversy with his deportation from Australia just before the start of the Australian Open, and his subsequent inability to play in the U.S. Open as well due to his vaccination status. We are not looking to get into a political and or medical discussion about that, but these events certainly raised Djokovic, Djokovic's news profile during the year. He, of course, then won Wimbledon, but earned no ATP ranking points from it due to the ATP revoking all points from Wimbledon due to the Russian and Belarusian player ban. Though he played only in 11 tournaments all year, he won five of them and made two other finals. He finished the year steamrolling through the ATP finals and making a strong case that he had played that had he played all the Grand Slams, he would have been the year-end number one and did put everyone else on notice for the start of 2023. ATP, take note. 
He's playing in the 2023 Australian Open, where he's only won nine previous titles there. Does anyone else want to watch an Alcaraz Djokovic Grand Slam final? Get your popcorn ready. Let's talk about Young Guns, breakout players of 2022. And this award, I'm going to warn you, shows a little home country bias. I'm not going to lie. First, let's start with some loose criteria. Since you could clearly say that Carlos Alcaraz and Iga Swiatek as players of the year could also be considered a breakout and young guns of the year, I'm going to exclude them from consideration. Also, I'm going to say young gun doesn't necessarily mean new on tour, but rather age 21 or younger. And of course, the term breakout is a relative term. With that in mind, my first Young Gun Breakout Player of the Year is the w on the WTA is Coco Goff. Yes, she has been on tour now already for a few years. But remember, she's only 18, and 2022 was the year she moved from a top 20 player to break into the top 5, where I expect she will stay for years to come. She made her first Grand Slam final in 2022, reaching the French Open final, and had her second best Grand Slam showing ever, reaching the U.S. Open quarterfinals. So yes, I realize that some may not consider her a true, quote, breakout player, but these awards are 100% biased. Sorry. Playing the home country bias card once again, my ATP Young Gun Breakout Player of the Year is Brandon Nakashima. At age 21, having won the year-end next-gen ATP Finals, things are looking up for the former UVA player. He won a 250-level title in his hometown of San Diego, but let's not forget he also made the round of 32 at the U.S. Open and French Opens and the round of 16 at Wimbledon. The guy has shown he can play on the biggest stages in the world against some of the best players. His losses at the French and Wimbledon and U.S. Open were against Zverev, Kyrgios, and Yannick Sinner, and he did take Kyrgios to five sets at Wimbledon. At the start of 2020, Brandon was number 364 in the world. He jumped to 170 at the start of 2021 and now finds himself in the top 50. 2023 will be a big year for him. Can he make a push for the top 25? We will see. I've already made a video of this shot of the year and I'll provide a link to it in the discussion for a complete breakdown and analysis of the point. But let's just say that when I was thinking about what might be considered for this award, this shot from more than six months earlier immediately came to mind. I remember watching this point live and being blown away by the athleticism. Ultimately, we watch sports for the pageantry and physical athleticism on display. Well, this point in the quarterfinals of Wimbledon, tennis's most high-profile event, meets all of that criteria and is why I think it stands above many other noteworthy nominations. Okay, let's recap this point real quick. It is the fifth set in the quarterfinals of Wimbledon. Yannick Sinner playing Novak Djokovic. The two have already been playing for three and a half hours. This is Sinner's serve. Sinner hits a good 118 mile an hour serve out wide, taking Djokovic out of position and making him off balance. Sinner steps in to take the short return and hits to the open court. And then magic happens, and that's a winner, folks. Let's look at it in slow motion. Djokovic leaps, slides, turns his body to hit the backhand winner cross court. That is the shot of the year. Thank you. So... While a tweener at one all in a challenger level event at 40 love might look cool, the stakes are low and the body is fresh. This winner by Djokovic psychologically put the nail in the coffin for Yannick Sinner. He didn't win a game after this point was played. Love him or hate him, you have to admit Djokovic's athleticism is superhuman and his showmanship is on point and second to none. This point truly demonstrates a superhuman level of athleticism. Moving on to the 2022 Tennis Match of the Year, I will mention that I did include all tennis matches played in the year 2022. That's right, I scoured YouTube for clips of 3.5 USTA matches, 
I watched matches between two eight point something UTRs. I watched every single minute of every single tennis match played everywhere in the world all in one year. Okay, I actually really didn't. But after watching quite a significant amount of tennis in 2022, I finally settled on the Australian Open men's final featuring Rafael Nadal and Daniil Medvedev, where Nadal won in five sets, 2-6, 6-7, 6-4, 6-4, 7-5. Medvedev has got the hammer and nails out and is about to put the lid on the coffin. So let's talk about the key point of the match. Uh, The announcer, as you just heard, said that the lid was on Nadal's coffin. Uh, He was now facing triple break point after Medvedev had just hit a very nice winner down the line. Uh, Nadal was now facing Love 40, my favorite score and was down 2-3 but on serve in the third set. Down two sets to Love already and now facing triple break point. Had Nadal lost his serve, Medvedev would have had smooth sailing to a straight set, rather routine win in the Australian Open Finals. Instead, let's see what happens. Nadal hits a gutsy first serve with Medvedev standing quite far back on the service return, follows that up with one of his patented heavy forehands, and then hits a very gutsy drop shot. That was pretty much the point of the match in my mind. It was the turning point. Nadal followed that point up by holding serve. He still had to fight off two more break points, mind you. He went on to win that set and then win the fourth and fifth set to take the match in five. For Medvedev to have lost that game, then the set, it was simply devastating for him. And as they say in poker, he proceeded to go on tilt. Nadal went on to win the match. Truly, truly an epic match. I know some people hate five-set marathons, not me. I personally love them. There is too much drama, too much tension. The tides turn so many times over the course of the match. This match had a number of really interesting features. It was almost five and a half hours long, and to sustain such elite competition over that period of time, I find it just simply incredible. Um, Matches that long are both mentally and physically draining, and so I love everything that a five-setter stands for. Even if television producers and schedulers rip their hair out over a match that lasts this long um, and is not based on some sort of fo- like timed conclusion, I'll be honest, I love them, and thus I chose this as my match of the year. There were a few particularly quirky features about the match. First, Nadal was out aced 23-3. to Medvedev essentially won almost a full set's worth of free points on his serve. And Nadal only had three aces, though he's never been known as a big server. Um, This is further testament in my mind to Nadal's mental fortitude and sheer will to win. He had to really earn every single point on his serve while Medvedev was earning many free points with the aces. Nadal actually won fewer points than Medvedev throughout the entire match, winning 182 points to Medvedev's 189. This means Nadal won only 49% of the total points, which again I think speaks to his mental fortitude and will to win. He made sure that he won the points that mattered, as evidenced by that triple break point he faced in the third set. Additionally, this match I think had a lot of historical significance, and that also boosted it up the rankings in my mind for match of the year. It completed Rafael Nadal's career double slam, where he joined... Laver, Emerson, and Djokovic as the only men's players to win all four Grand Slams twice. So I think anyone who says that Nadal is only capable or only a good player on clay is certainly way off. Additionally, winning the Australian Open in 2022 broke the three-way tie that Nadal had with Djokovic and Federer for 20 total career Grand Slams, less than a year after Djokovic had tied everything up by winning his 20th at Wimbledon in 2021. Nadal would go on to win the French Open and run his Grand Slam title count to 22, with Djokovic yet to tie him back up, though he could do so at 
the 2023 Australian Open. But again, this was the match that essentially broke the three-way tie and has put him on top since then. He still has one Grand Slam clear of Djokovic's total. And so I think, again, the significance of this match is important to point out. On the other hand, the match, too, kind of put the brakes on Daniil Medvedev's rise and kind of set the stage for what was otherwise a lackluster or disappointing year for him. Nadal battled both, excuse me, Daniel battled both Nadal and the crowd during the Australian Open final match, and ultimately for the rest of the year would go on to win only two smaller tournaments in 2022, a 250-level event in Los Cabos and a 500-level event in Vienna. He lost another 250-level final against a player ranked outside the top 200. He was banned from Wimbledon through no fault of his own and then was abruptly swept out of the ATP Finals year-end tournament, losing all three round-robin matches. Certainly, this was not the best year for Medvedev, and it was kind of punctuated by this heartbreaking loss at the beginning of the season at the year's first Grand Slam. One more thing I just wanted to point out, um, kind of maybe makes this match a little bit more significant as well. Hear me out. The Australian Open took place in the last two weeks of January, concluding on January 30th of 2022. Rafael Nadal's first child, his son also named Rafael, was born in the first half of October 2022. So let's see here. October is the 10th month of the year, and nine months earlier would be January. So, well... I'm just saying it might make this match even more significant. So let me know what you think. Who were your players of the year? Who might make this list in 2023? What was your favorite match or favorite point of 2022? Let me know in the comments below. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up and consider subscribing to the channel. We still have a, to preview 2023 recap my prior predictions for 2022, here's a spoiler alert, I was way off, and talk more tennis. Thanks for watching.